Last week, we took a look at Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through Acts chapter 5, verse 11. And there we saw in this particular text how the early church was truly stunning. First of all, in this passage, we read how the believer's practice of biblical stewardship was impressive and remarkable. Each person who made up the early church, they rightfully recognized that all of their personal belongings and wealth ultimately was a blessing from God and was to be used to bless others, especially those who were of need in the early church. So stunning was the early church's practice of biblical stewardship that Acts chapter 4 verse 34 reports that there was not a needy person among them. In the following passage, in the beginning of Acts chapter 5, we also read how God's sanctification of the early church was a noteworthy and eye-opening. Through the sudden deaths of Ananias and Sapphira following their deceptive donation, God made it very clear that he was serious, and that he is serious when it comes to the collective purity of the church. So stunning was God's swift judgment upon the sin of Ananias and Sapphira that verse 11 reports that great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. This week as we continue in our study of the book of Acts, we are going to see in Acts chapter 5 verses 12 through 16, that the early church can also be described not just as stunning, but now also miraculous. Now before we get into this text, however, it's important that we gain a biblical understanding of what a miracle truly is. You see, nowadays, unfortunately, many occurrences are automatically labeled as miraculous when that may not necessarily be the case. And so this word, miracle or miraculous, to some degree has been cheapened over the last several decades. For example, going to Costco last spring, two weeks into the shutdown, hoping to find seeing, grabbing, and then running to the register and purchasing the last package of toilet paper was not a miracle. (laughs) That was just good timing. An academically troubled student receiving an A on an exam is not miraculous, but the results of hard work of studying or cheating. The Detroit Lions winning the Super Bowl next season (laughs) will not be considered a miracle, but okay, that would indeed be miraculous. On a more serious note though, a cancer patient going into remission and later becoming cancer free or perhaps even a little seven-year-old girl with a heart defect receiving a brand new heart, in all honesty, according to the Bible, is probably more accurately labeled as God's providential care. God's providential care, let me just quickly define this for you, is His constant His intricate, His sovereign involvement in the ongoing activities and preservation of the world. And so we see God's sovereign, providential care being displayed through, in those particular cases, through the doctor's medical knowledge and the proper treatment. Does that make sense? 
in contrast to these special occurrences, and even in contrast to God's providence, a true miracle is best defined by the best definition that I could find for a true biblical miracle is by this guy. His name is Wayne Grudem. And Wayne Grudem, he is a very prominent Bible scholar, and he has this definition, and I have it on the screen here, if it's going to work for me. There we go. And Wayne Grudem says this, and I agree with him here. A miracle is a rare, or excuse me, a less common, so it is rare, kind of God's activity in which he arouses people's awe and wonder and bears witness to himself. So let me take a little bit of time and we'll break down this definition of what a true, what a biblical miracle is. According to this definition, and as affirmed in the Scriptures, we'll see this later on in just a few moments in today's passage, a true miracle, it contains two key components. First of all, and most obvious, a true biblical miracle arouses people's awe and wonder. In other words, a true miracle, biblical miracle, is awe-inspiring. It draws everyone's attention, believer and non-believer. And then upon closer examination, people come to see that this particular miracle cannot be explained by or with natural causes. It then causes people to wonder how it came to be. So that is the first component, is that a true biblical miracle, it is awe-inspiring. Secondly, and I would say this is the most important feature of a true biblical miracle, is that it, according to this definition, bears witness to God. In other words, a true miracle is not just awe-inspiring, but it is also God-honoring. It directs everyone's attention towards the one true God. Upon examination, people come to see that only God in His powerful actions, His sovereign activity within this world is capable of performing that particular miracle. It ultimately causes people to understand and gain a greater understanding, gain greater insight into God's powerful and immense character. And then also, the miracle, it aids individuals in placing their faith, in placing their trust in God, in God's Word, and in God's Son, Jesus Christ. And so when we take a look at the Scriptures, we see that the Bible clearly makes it obvious that miracles have been taking place all throughout time and history. If we were to go to the Old Testament at the very beginning of the Bible, we would see the biggest miracle described. And that is the creation of creation. How God brought into existence everything out of absolutely nothing. How many of you can do that? If we were to continue on in the Old Testament, we would read other miracles. In Exodus chapter 14, we would read about how God, the one true God, saved His people, the Israelites, from Pharaoh and the Egyptians by parting the Red Sea and having His people walk across dry land where there used to be water. And then a couple of chapters later, we would see another miracle performed. How God fed the Israelites for 40 years on a daily basis by providing manna from heaven. 
of bread-like substance. We turn our attention to the New Testament. We would see that miracles continued to occur at the beginning of the New Testament in the Gospels. It talks about Jesus' birth, His miraculous birth, how He was born of the Virgin Mary. We continue on. We take a look at Jesus' ministry. We see Jesus performing miracle after miracle after miracle. The first one was Him at a wedding turning large vats of water into some of the finest wine. And then, at the end of the Gospels, we see the greatest miracle described of them all. We see Jesus' resurrection from the dead. How Jesus Christ, how He was dead and how His body was in the tomb. And then how God miraculously brought Jesus back to life, restored life to His dead of body. And then after the Gospels, when we take a look in the rest of the New Testament, and even in the book of Acts, we see it being reported there that miracles occurred regularly within and through the early church. So take a look at that first verse for us today. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Acts chapter 5, verse 12 affirms this miraculous aspect of the early church. It says this, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people and by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. And so this morning, with the rest of the time that we have together, I want to go through this passage very briefly and hit upon two miraculous aspects of the early church that are alluded to and spoken of in this verse. And so first of all, and not as apparent, but it is still there and it's just as miraculous, In the second half of verse 12 and verse 13, and then also in verse 14, these verses here, they describe the early church as a miraculous multitude. A miraculous multitude. Now, pretty much up to this point in the book of Acts, we see that the early church was experiencing exponential growth. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it is reported that on the day of Pentecost, this is the church's birthday, the initial community of Jesus' disciples grew from about 120 to about 3,000 souls. Then, at the beginning of Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 4, just about a chapter and a half later, it is reported there that the church increased to about 5,000 men, it says. And so some Bible scholars estimate, including the women and then also the children, that at that point, this very, very early stage of the early church, the church's population could have possibly reached, maybe even exceeded 10,000 people. So it is clear that the early church was on the rise. It was gaining steam and it was becoming a dominant force in Jerusalem. In the remainder of chapter 4, and at the beginning of chapter 5, however, the church is seen encountering both external physical and also internal spiritual opposition. We've gone over these particular chapters over the last few weeks. In chapter 4, the Jewish leaders, they temporarily imprisoned and publicly threatened the church leaders. They said, you are going to stop preaching the gospel. You're going to stop proclaiming the truth about Jesus Christ. And if you refuse to, we are going to throw you in jail. And then in verse, or excuse me, and then in chapter 5, like we read like we read last week, 
Ananias and Sapphira's deceptive donation also threatened the church's purity. And so from a worldly viewpoint, these series of unfortunate events could easily be deemed today as a bad PR hit for the early church, right? And perhaps just too great of opposition to overcome. Especially the recently revealed reality that Ananias and Sapphira died for simply committing a white lie. Can you imagine being there? Being outside the church, not being a believer, seeing what is going on in the early church, and then you catch wind of the facts that two individuals literally dropped dead for committing a white lie. Would you, as, a, as, as divine judgment, would that attract you to that particular group? That would probably give me a little bit of pause before I ventured out and to do a little bit of investigation to see what that community was all about. And indeed, the text says that these situations did prevent some people from publicly attending the church's gatherings and placing their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 states that none of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. Now this supposed negative press, in spite of this negative press, the text continues on. In fact, the rest of the book records that these unfortunate events here never actually came close to stopping or even slowing down the church's growth. Instead, amazingly, look at what verse 14 reports. Verse 14 says, More than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So in the aftermath of encountering these external physical opposition, and then also facing internal spiritual opposition, we see that the early church experienced growth like never before. It says right there, more than ever. Their growth at this time was greater than the growth that they had received just within the first few days, first few weeks. In fact, so great was the early church's growth that they literally stopped counting. Instead of providing a numeric figure, they just said there were multitudes of people at this point who joined the church. HGC, how is this possible? How is this possible? How did the early church not just survive, but thrive in the face of such great opposition? There is only one possible explanation. And that is, this was clearly a work of God. It was a miracle. Many Christians today, after surveying the current political and cultural landscape, they wonder how the church is going to survive. They wonder how the church, how local churches are going to fare when they are faced with the external threats of the Equality Act, which affirms, which basically says you need to affirm the LGBTQ lifestyle or you're going to lose your tax exempt status. Some people wonder how churches are going to fare when they are tempted internally to compromise, to ease up on teaching the Bible and proclaiming what the Bible teaches when it comes to the exclusive claims of the Bible that there is definitely a right and wrong and that there is just one way to God, to heaven, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ. 
HGC, we need to know that God, He has not promised us, His people, He has not promised to protect us from hard times. Take a look at your Bible. Start reading in Genesis. You can go all the way through Revelation. You're not going to find a single verse that says that if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you become one of God's people, your life then is going to become a walk in the park. That is not what the Bible says. But when we read our Bibles, we do see God promising us, His people, that He will be with us and He will preserve us through those difficult times. I think of Psalm 23, King David. King David, you know, we may think, oh, he was a king. He had a life of luxury and ease. When we go back and we read about King David, actually, his life was pretty tough. Even though he was in a place of prominence and a place of power, he faced opposition daily. Not just from outside his kingdom, but also from within Israel. And in Psalm 23, famous passage, many of you know this. King David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. Why? Because God, you are with me. HCC, we need to also know that God, he uses those difficult times. And he uses difficult times to prune the church, to cut off the excess fat, so to speak. And not only does he prune us, but he uses those hard times to make us more potent, to make us more powerful in his hands. I want you to keep your fingers there in the book of Acts, and I want you to turn in your Bibles to James. James chapter 1. <clears throat> so you're going to get to Hebrews, and right after Hebrews is the book of James. James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. He, or excuse me, James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. It says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Let's just stop there. Right here we see James. James is saying, when you face opposition, whether it be externally or internally, give praise to God. Count it a matter or a time to rejoice. Because take a look at what God's going to do with this difficulty in your life. Look at verses 3 and 4. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Right here we see... God uses difficult times in His people's lives. God uses opposition when it is directed at the church, whether it's internal or external, to make us more complete, to cut off the excess fats, to make us more powerful tools in His hands. There is a saying that was penned by an ancient Christian, his name was Tertullian. He was a believer, a leader in the church in northern Africa in the second century. And he says this, and we see this ringing true in the scriptures. He says, and I quote, The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Let me say that again. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. God does not let anything go to waste. God does not let the opposition that we face go to waste. When we continue on as we reach the end of the book of Acts, which will probably be like in five years or whatever, the pace we're going. But we're going to see the Apostle Paul. We haven't even encountered him yet. 
And we're going to see Paul reach Rome. And he gets to Rome, but he's imprisoned there. And as church history has it, ultimately the emperor Nero, who was an absolutely wicked ruler, he makes any ruler that we have come upon today seem like a unicorn or a princess unicorn. I don't know. Nero was a wicked man. But we see Nero, church history has it, putting Paul to death. Well, what happens in Rome? The church is established and it grows. We take a look today at some churches and other areas of our world that are facing immense persecution. You want to know where the church is absolutely the strongest right now? It's in the communist country of China and in certain countries in Africa. Yesterday I was on a, uh, a missionary ministry website and this particular missionary ministry was located in Africa. And guess where they're sending their missionaries? Here to America. And they had the statistic that said 78% of the people who live in America claim to be Christian. However, 18%, only 18% or something like something along those lines, actually attend church on a regular basis. America is becoming a mission field. America is a mission field. HCC, we reside here in America in a mission field. HCC, our existence right now is due entirely to God's grace. If it were not for God's grace in our lives, in our communities, guess what? The opposition that we would have, that, that our spiritual ancestors would have faced years and years, years ago would have wiped us off the face of this planet. Would have been just a little side mark in history. But here we stand, gathered today, as evidence of God's miraculous grace. Amen? As we continue on in our passage today, as we turn back to Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, the first part of verse 12 and then verses 15 and 16 declare that the early church, not only was it a miraculous multitude, but it also had a miraculous ministry. Do you like these little M's that I got going here? I'm doing pretty good. I feel like I'm on a roll. So far throughout the book of Acts, uh, this feature of the early church has been highlighted. Going back to Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit powerfully came upon and indwelt the believers. Every single one of them at that particular point in time, on the church's birthday, they were given the miraculous ability to speak in a, in a known, in an, excuse me, they were, they were given the miraculous ability to speak in another known human language that was previously not known to them. I don't know a lick of Chinese. So if I were then, let's just say, and the Holy Spirit descended upon me, it would be, I would be able to speak Chinese, like fluently. And we go back to Acts chapter 2, and we see all these believers given this sudden ability to speak a foreign language. And what did they declare with that foreign language? They declared the gospel. They told the people who were around them the greatness of Jesus Christ, of who He is, how He's, how he's the Son of God, how He's the Savior from sin, and how He's Lord over all creation. In the following chapter, in Acts chapter 3, we read about and we studied a few weeks ago about Peter's miraculous healing of a paralytic in the temple. This man had been paralyzed for over 40 years. Peter and John, two early church leaders, they're walking into the temple to worship. They see this man here who has been lame for over 40 years. And Peter heals this particular individual. At that time, all of the other Jewish worshipers, they look at this particular miracle take place, right? Their attention is gained. They can't, they, news spreads throughout the rest of the temple. They all go running to the lame man. And what does Peter then do? 
Does he stand back and be like, yep, look at what I did. Look at how I healed this man who's been basically lame from birth. Is that what Peter did? No, he took advantage of the situation. He said, now that I got everybody's attention, let me tell you about who's ultimately responsible. It's not me, but it's Jesus Christ who's resurrected from the dead. In today's passage, we could basically describe it as a summary of the early church's continued miraculous ministry. And in this summary here, there's a couple of observations that I want to point out to you. First of all, it is important to note that the miraculous ministry of the early church was run by the apostles. Look at the beginning of verse 12. The beginning of verse 12 says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done. First of all, many, right? Not just a few, but there were many signs and wonders. That's basically, that expression right there is synonymous with miracles. They were done occasionally, right? Is that what the text says? No, it says that they were done on a regular basis. And they were done among the people by your average churchgoer. No? That's not what your Bible says? My Bible says that these miracles, they were done among the people by the hands of the apostles. The apostles' miracles were truly awe-inspiring. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 reports how Peter's shadow was used to heal the sick. How many of you can make your shadow do anything? No, none of you. None of us have that ability. Yet here we see Peter's shadow as it fell upon sick individuals, restoring the, sick, the, 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 the health of the sick. Now, upon examination, obviously no natural cause could be suggested to explain this occurrence. Instead, the witnesses of these miracles, their attention would have been directed towards the one true God. They would have then affirmed the truth that God was powerfully at work through Peter and the rest of the apostles. In this particular miracle here, would not have not only affirmed Peter's ministry, but even more so specifically the message that Peter undoubtedly preached after he had performed that miracle. Just like we saw him in the previous chapter. Just after he healed that lame man there in Acts chapter 3, verse 16, Peter is seen preaching the gospel. He says in Acts chapter 3, verse 16, And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So through the miracles that Peter and the apostles performed, we see that the gospel of Jesus Christ was affirmed. And that is what we see with true biblical miracles. When true biblical miracles occur, we see that they affirm the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing that I want to point out to you. The second thing that I want to point out to you this morning the second observation that I want to make is that the miraculous ministry of the early church extended beyond Jerusalem's city limits. Look at the very last verse. Look at verse number 16. Verse number 16 reports that the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. The apostles' miraculous ministry was expanding. Even though they were still in Jerusalem, 
the effects of their, of their miraculous ministry could be felt outside the walls of Jerusalem by those living outside of this city. And this is important to note because if you remember all the way back when we started our study of the book of Acts, you will recall in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that Jesus told the apostles, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so when we take a look at verse 16, we see verse 16 shows how the apostles' miraculous ministry began to reach out into that next region outside of Jerusalem, that being Judea. So through the miracles that the apostles performed, that Peter performed, we see that the gospel of Jesus Christ was not only affirmed, but we also see that the gospel of Jesus Christ was advancing. Advancing the kingdom of God. Advancing the early church. HGC, I wish I could come before you today and give an explanation of how these miracles took place. wish I could give you an explanation of how Peter's shadow healed the sick. But guess what? I can't. You know why I can't? Because it's a miracle. In fact, the only thing I can do in trying to explain how Peter's shadow healed the sick is point to God. <coughs> Excuse me. Even more specifically, point to our resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I do believe that true biblical miracles happen today. I do believe that they do occur on some type of a basis. Some people that say that today that they're rare. Some people say that they happen more commonly. We're just not aware of them, which I would say, well, that kind of defeats the definition of what a miracle is. Like we talked about earlier, a miracle grabs everyone's attention. It is awe-inspiring. I personally have not witnessed any miracles in my life. However, talking to missionaries who minister outside of the United States and third world countries, I've talked to missionaries going all the way back to my days in college and even just a few weeks ago, and they attest to the fact that they have seen some miraculous things happen in their lives and in their ministries. <coughs> It's important to note, though, that true biblical miracles do not become the focus in and of themselves. What we see here, a true biblical miracle turns everyone's, or first of all, it gains everyone's attention, but then it turns everyone's attention towards uh, Jesus Christ. And right there, I guess you can say, is a miracle that I have seen take place. And that is the miracle of salvation. The miracle of how God miraculously transforms sinners into saints. How God miraculously <coughs> redeems individuals from being children of wrath until children of God. HCC, this is a miraculous thing that you perhaps have even experienced in your own life. How you were once blind, but now you see the truth about Jesus Christ and who He is. How now you see that Jesus is indeed the Son of God who came some 2,000 years ago to die on the cross for your sins so that your relationship with God can be restored and you can be given a hope. You can be given the assurance that yes, one day you will die, but upon your death, your soul, your spirit will be ushered into God's immediate glorious presence. And there you will be with God and His people forevermore. And even further proof that one day at Jesus' return, that your body, which is dead, laying in the ground, will be powerfully resurrected, brought back to life, reunited with your soul and spirit. 
And there you will enter into the millennial kingdom and the eternal kingdom of God. HCC, just how the apostles were given the ability to perform miracles, we have been given the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have been commissioned to go out and to declare the good news about Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, and his coming return. And as we are faithful unto this task, be on the lookout because a miracle might just take place, right? Somebody may just hear the message that you are declaring to them. And as God sovereignly opens up their eyes to see the truth about His Son, you will witness somebody go from a sinner into a saint, from child wrath into a child of God. Let us pray. <coughs> Dearly Father, we come before you today, Lord. We want to thank you for this day that you have given us. We want to thank you for the opportunity to gather here to worship you, to take a look at your word, to see what your word has to tell us about who you are. Dearly Father, I pray that you would give us an opportunity this week to take this gospel message and to share it with others. And as we do so, I pray that you would be sovereignly at work in convicting those individuals of their sin and recognizing the need to place their faith in, in your Son as their Savior. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that today, if there's anyone here that does not know you and does not and is not aware of your son and who he is i pray that you would perform that miracle in their life that you would open up their eyes their ears the hearts to see the truth heavenly father once again we want to thank you for this day we want to thank you ultimately for your son and we just pray this prayer in your son's powerful name jesus christ amen hcc please rise as we close our worship service out in song Lord, let the light of your light is shining in the midst of the darkness. I, Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Tread us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Father's glory, 
in prison from the shadow to your radiance by the blood i may enter your brightness search me try me consume oh my god the sign on me shine on me shine jesus shine let your soul be the brother's glory HCC, we want to thank you so much for coming out today. I um, hope you have a great Valentine's Day. The sun is shining. That is a good thing. Uh, before we leave, do not forget to sign those cards back there for those individuals. And then also there is a piece of chocolate on the other side for you. That's my Valentine's Day gift from me to you. So with that being said, HCC, as we go, we need to love God, love others, and make disciples. God bless. forgot to turn off the... Uh...